Welcome to everyone. This is Structure 1515, and we are right now in Series 2 on topics looking at balance. And I'm Andrea Stumpf, and we are today going to be talking about strengthening the core. Uh, so here's the gig I present for 15 minutes. We do a set of slides, and uh, I keep to the time, and then we have time to talk afterwards. So let me get going. And we'll begin by looking just at the a few introductory slides. Here are my two books, The Primer for Partners, The Book for Builders, which are uh, these award-winning books, which is where the content comes from, most of what we're talking about today, although we will go deeper than what's in the books. But if you like the discussion today, you'll probably like these books as well. I also like to start by framing the whole exercise because it does help to know you know, why you're here and what we're trying to do. So it's really about answering this question, do you know where you are in the landscape? And of course, the idea is that if you can see yourself in the landscape, uh, if you can um, see the landscape and where you are in it, then you can hopefully see the options more clearly and make some better choices. So specifically, we're in the international arena and we're talking about international partnership programs Although really most of what we're gonna talk about today applies to partnerships across the board. And I think also life in, generally, in general. Um, and a heads up that we'll be seeing this image, this uh, photo in a moment again. Now a quick definitional slide, these international partnership programs are not new. And to the contrary, there are hundreds if not thousands of them out there but I am trying to define them more precisely and in doing so really underscore their value and show that there's a practice area around structuring this kind of partnership modality. So specifically definitionally, we are in international space and this is it. It's just these two components. You have a dedicated new element, which is the governing body, which embodies the partnership. And then we add to that support from an existing, so an established entity, and that can be a multilateral development bank like the World Bank that many of us know well, or UN agencies, other international organizations. And those two elements, that really constitutes the definition. I usually indicate that there's a third component that typically comes on board, and that can be a new or dedicated partnership um, trust fund, a funding vehicle, and these international trust funds, of course, add some complexity. But with these three components, this is really the lion's share of what international partnership programs uh, definitionally get consistent. So of course, we've been at this topic for a while. Um, we're kind of nearing the end of the series, and Balance is not always so easy. So today we're going to look at how the core plays into that. So as to the core, just want to start by saying that whatever really constitutes the core of an international partnership program, there's definitely a lot of variety. And as with everything about these partnerships, the core is really organic. Uh, it's not a a fixed point or a solid object. It's a happening thing. It's living, breathing, and it changes from the beginning to the end. And yet I am gonna to try to say a few basic things about what it means to strengthen the core and to get better balance that way. So specifically, let's take a closer look. And here we are back at that photo from the landscape um, earlier. If you look at the photo, I don't know how well you can see, but there's that spider, which is within a web, within a larger web. So there is a core, but it's, you know, maybe the core is the spider, maybe the core is that first web, maybe the core is the whole web. Um, the point is that when you're dealing with a partnership, you're actually not talking about a single thing when you're talking about the core. Um, it's kind of in the nature of partnering, but even if you look at your apple core, it's a combination of a lot of stuff biologically. So certainly in a partnership environment, the first point would be that when, when you are looking at strengthening the core, you're really looking at strengthening how you combine the partners and the partnering elements. 
The other thing is that it's not the only essential thing. So in defining the core, you're in effect also defining the non-core. And for any of you that have worked in or with these partnership programs, you know that it's not just the core that's important, but the other parts can be very important as well, sometimes as important. So here's my working hypothesis. The strengthening of the core of a partnership program really means fortifying the core itself as to its composite elements and its relationship to the rest of the partnership. And of course, if we think about it, the topics that we've had in the balance series so far, we've actually been talking about core quite a lot. We've been talking about finding the sweet spot, critical mass, how to work with center of gravity, the firm foundation. Those are all really core topics. But today, I want to take you essentially to the next level. And we're going to talk about core in the context, in the context of these partnership programs as a matter of relationships. So that really is about delineating and connecting. That's a phrase you've heard me say quite a lot, at least some of you, and also linking and aligning. So I'm gonna put it to you this way. In partnering, the core is only as strong as the connections. And some of you may recognize this slide from our earlier session. Um, I'm going to go through four slides now, and I will show you four sets of relationships that are very fundamental to strengthening the core. I'll do this quickly, of course, because I'm limited in time, but I would suggest that attention to each one of these four, and there are many more, but these are four key ones that can really help you strengthen the core of your partnership program. So for the first one, we're gonna kind of go back to the definitional um, slide and kind of look at basically go back to basics here. The secretariat governing body relationship is one of those key relationships in terms of strengthening the core. So we have the governing body, that was the new component, and the supporting entity, which is the existing established component. And it's within that supporting entity that we have the secretariat or secretariat type functions. You don't have to call it a secretariat that is supporting the governing body. And we can say a few things about that. In fact, we looked at the secretariat very closely in one of the series one sessions and that's available on YouTube. So there's lots more there, but just very quickly, here we are at the definitional core of the partnership program. And it's very interesting to think about this relationship which in very broad strokes, you know, grosso modo, the dynamic is really around the secretariat, in other words, the supporting entity, taking on a number of obligations and the governing body in effect, defining for itself certain rights in connection with those obligations. So this is a really a kind of a rights and obligations type exercise. But this link also crucially rides on what we have you know, previously also discussed. It rides on an inward outward modality through secretariat functions that are embedded in the supporting entity and operate under supporting entity rules. And this is not necessarily easy. This can be pretty complicated. And how well the secretariat manages this duality within the context of the supporting entity in relation to the governing body is gonna have very significant ramifications for balance for the whole partnership. So a second one that's really worth focusing on is what I call the secretariat trustee axis. And here we again are at that definitional slide, but this time putting the trustee in view. So if you have a partnership program with a trustee, this axis, axis is really important. And let's make a, few points about this one. First of all, you can see that the secretariat trustee, these functions, and again, we have a series one session that distinguishes between secretary and trustee, but those functions are essentially a linkage on the administrative plane. And so you can think of it as a very solid structural beam within the context of the partnership program. It's usually, within the same supporting entity. And when that happens, you have huge potential for synergies. 
So looking at how the secretariat and the trustee play together or how these functions interact, again, is gonna have some very significant balance, balance ramifications for the whole program. Now, a third one, and of course, being a lawyer, I have to bring the documents into this. A third one is also thinking about how your documents work together in a kind of packaging and alignment context. So I will just point out a few things here. First of all, I wanna just hold on to the notion that these international partnership documents, whether they're agreements or other types of documents, are, they should be more operational than legal. They really should be useful to the partnership. The other notion is that partners can collectively own some of these documents. In fact, there is really value in having at least some of these documents or some part of the partnership terms be collectively owned. And how does that happen? How do you do that? It's basically the governing body adopting uh, the terms of these documents. Now, against those two points, I think the approach that is really helpful in terms of strengthening the core is to think of these documents as a package to try to make sure that the terminology is aligned, that they're using similar terms, that they're talking to each other in other ways that you can cross-reference, that you're looking for gaps and overlaps within the package of documents, and that you're drafting really strategically to think about where you want flexibility and um, how you can really support the partnership over the long term. So I have lots and lots in the book for builders on this. That's actually the main part of the book for builders is how this packaging and alignment works. But here too is a set of relationships that really can make a big difference in creating a strong core. Now I will give you my fourth one, my fourth and last one. Uh, we usually focus on the individual partnership, but the next level thinking really calls for us to also look at partnership to partnership relationships and really take a look at this across the international arena. So I'm gonna pick on health right here, but we could really do this with any sector. But if you're thinking about the health sector, for example, you may recognize some of these names. Uh, I guess it's really um, clear that this is a very busy space in the international landscape. Um, in fact, I've just recently heard that there's talk of adding a new fund which is supposed to be even greater. The fund of funds is what it's being called that will also play in this space. So here, you know, a closer look at this will help us think about strengthening the core of each of the individual partnerships by looking at this across the landscape. We, we actually do talk about international aid architecture, which implies structure. And yet I don't know that we really think about it as structurally as we could. But I, I would suggest that it's the same kind of exercises with the documents. It's really thinking about it, taking a kind of package approach to it, thinking about it collectively and looking to ways to align to that these partnerships talk to each other, that we're looking for gaps and overlaps. And ultimately really the main point is to be complementary and not to be competitive. And in that way, not strengthening the core of each individual partnership only, but it really across the board, helping the international landscape have strengthened partnerships. So with those four, let me just recap and do it again. Uh, the core is only as strong as the connections. We talked about the secretariat governing body relationship. So here it is, bam. We also, Talked about the secretariat trustee axis within the supporting entity. Bam, got that one. We talked about document packaging and alignment. That is a kind of partnership program-wide exercise. There we are with that. And then aid architecture structure and alignment really across the international landscape. So those are four key relationships. And ultimately, I think really it's a way of saying that the core and how to strengthen it is a question of context and that it's really in the connections, the core in relation to its connections that will make the difference. So let me just close with my quote from Partnering to Go. 
Uh, this is from my book for builders. Once again, it is in the balance. Partners do not need to sell themselves short or be under ambitious. They can be simultaneously prudent and opportunistic. But remember, when you anchor your rope to the mountainside, make sure the link is strong and secure before climbing on to higher heights. And that's my story. Uh, just to flag that next month, we're going to do incrementalism and innovation on May 11th, and that will be the last one of this series. And with that, we get to stop the share and move on to the conversation. All right, wonderful. I'd like to open the floor and see if any of that resonated with you. I know Stephen will have to leave a bit early. So Stephen, you're welcome to jump in. Nicola, anyone who's got their camera on, please uh, let us know what you think. Well, I, I, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll start the conversation. Um, I, I thought that the fruit basket was very apt. <clears throat> um, I work in the energy space. There isn't yeah. enough fruit in the basket to cover <laughs> what's happening in the energy space. Yeah. And, um, and particularly what the private sector has done. We didn't really touch on the private sector actors, but we know who the international folks are and the other agencies and the alphabet soup of of intergovernmental partnerships that we live with. But at least in the energy space, we're now dealing with the Rockefeller Foundation um, is getting much more proactive and even to the point of wanting to enter into agreed partnerships with the bank for certain things. Uh, they're negotiating, I'm negotiating to be to, to work with uh, with SMAP on 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 um, 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 off-grid. But at the same time, Rockefeller is also supporting SE for All and other partnerships. And that calls into question very interesting, how do we as a bank enter into a partnership with somebody who's got partnerships with other organizations in the same subject matter? That's one. The other, you have the Earth Foundation of Jeff Bezos, where he has $10 billion, which he is dumping $100 million at a clip to NGOs in the energy space. And he isn't the only one in climate and energy. Uh, we now have this plethora of private sector um, billionaires who are putting money into the space and entering into interesting partnerships. Um, so in addition to the fruit basket, you have lots of private foundations that we also have to kind of keep an eye on and their governance structures are really maybe a lot different than what we're used to seeing. Uh, I haven't looked at you know, the Earth, Earth Foundation and how Jeff Bezos set it up. Uh, the only thing he did was uh, hire, um, um, uh, help me, Nicola, from the bank. Uh, 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 I used to have the World Resources Institute. Well, yes, he did. And now that you've um, said it, I can um, see it's Andrew. Andrew, Andrew Steer. Steer. So he, handled, he hires Andrew Steer, but I don't have no idea what the governance structure looks like on the 10 billion. And meanwhile, they're pumping it out to, to, to all kinds of entities that are then coming to the bank and wanting to do things. So we've got this, the, 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 the environment has changed. And, and the other is the last 30 days has completely turned upside down a lot of the partnerships. Um, and we're all kind of struggling to how do you re how kind of how do you move forward on COP27 and, and all the environmental work we're doing at a time when there's a retrenchment. And, and that's being thought through right now. And that certainly is implications for partnerships. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the core, when I look at what we just talked about, it's shifting in a way the, the, around us. It's, it's really, really, I suppose it's an exciting time to be here, but it's, it's these relationships are changing <laughs> between organic. the bank, the governments, these suddenly huge private sector foundations that have much more discretionary money than the bank does, who, are, who have 
somewhat different governance structures. And I know that, that in working with Rockefeller and trying to work out an agreement, that has come into play. And although I have been involved in, in lately, I, I, have to, I am aware of their lawyers, their public relations people have a different point of view on what the partner should, should look like versus what, our, what the bank's lawyers are, you know, and I don't have to discuss the bank's lawyers, Andrea, in this particular space. Um, and, it's, and it's created, it's slowed down the process of Rockefeller transferring money for the project, but it hasn't slowed Rockefeller down from putting money into other IGA, uh, international governmental organizations like SE for All or the UN um, that are paralleling what the bank is doing. And that's the point I wanted to make is that work we're doing, I'll use off grid, but it could be gas, it could be all kinds of stuff, is being paralleled in the, by, by the private sector. Sometimes we, and we bump up against this all the time. And co how we cooperate in country, how we, yeah, is evolving. It's, it's, it's hard to come up with a uniform policy. Um, what countries is Rockefeller going to go into versus where we are? SA for all is all over the place. Um, and uh, that whole structure is interesting. Uh, you have these, uh, it gets more interesting when you have a private sector foundation and a UN official. Uh, you can't, the blurring, the roles in going forward. And who's, when you, when you try to apply the principles that we've been discussing in the last few sessions, they don't apply to some entities that we have to work with that have a direct impact on the work we're doing. Um, and, I, and that's for another, and Andrea, you know, we were involved in creating SC for All as a private entity. Sure. And all that is for naught, really. I mean, it's, it, it, that's a kind of maybe sui generis, but nonetheless, it's a model run amok, and maybe it's a case study of what can go wrong when you try to do this. Maybe that's for another session, is let's look at something that isn't working, that we actually were present at the creation of and why it isn't working. And personalities very much matter. One last thing, I, time is running. We're also running into these ad hoc partnerships. Um, most recently, uh, when the Secretary General sends, sets up a crisis group to address the problems in the Ukraine, brings together 30, government, 30 UN agencies. The bank is on this thing. They're setting up technical working groups. You'll be pleased to know that Rachel Kite has reappeared as co-chair of the technical working group on energy, along with Don Malola, uh, my guy who took over SE for all from her. But they're creating this whole secretariat. The secretariat is being, is being run out of UNCTAD, and we're get, the bank is being drawn into it because we're a UN agency. Well, it's kind of a partnership. It's an ad hoc kind of thing. It has terms of reference. It has deliverables. And all of a sudden, the bank is being asked in energy, food, and finance to support this. And I, I could share the terms of reference, at least for energy. And you read it and it goes, oh, the bank's going to actually prepare all this work. I mean, you know, that, how do we respond to these ad hoc partnerships that are created to address an, an immediate concern that may have a short life that are operating on very thinly created terms of reference and nowhere nearly uh, as well structured as they should be, more political than substantive? I'll stop there. I see nodding, Nicole is nodding. It's always, it's always good well, to see positive nodding. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll take the chair's prerogative to just make a quick comment and then turn to Nicola who has her hand up. Um, the SE for all experience that you and I had, Stephen, and we spent probably a year, maybe more working on it in its early establishment days was all about trying to not even strengthen the core was simply defining the core. We were looking for where is the core of the structure and it was a lot of different pieces, but it didn't have the there there 
It didn't have documents. It didn't have a structure. It didn't have the thing that was going to like be the integral core around which you could build your center of gravity and buttress and do other things. So that I think was the early story of SE for All. And if we were to do our little diagnostic, I think we would certainly be lifting that out as a piece of it. Um, but Nicola, your hand is up. Please go and help us understand this. <laughs> I, I don't know about helping understand. I, I jumped at the same thing that, that Stephen did. So I sign up and sign on to much of, of what Stephen said. Um, uh, obviously, I don't have the same experience in the energy sector, but I can certainly relate to a lot of it. And the same uh, the same two things caught my attention. So I, I definitely, that basket, it's a really good illustration. I think you could go to many sectors, um, certainly agriculture and food security, a plethora of institutions as well as partnerships and, and that causes issues. And that's, that's what led me to be thinking about, I guess it was your next slide where you were pulling it all together with the, the links and the links and the circle and the and the ellipse and saying it's only as strong as as the the link and i wanted as the i guess as the weakest link and i wanted to point to the role of the donors in that because the donors sit in the governing bodies and they're also part of the broader stakeholder set that that ellipse the, that that broader architecture. Love the fact that you asked the question, are we really building an architecture? Really good question. I, I would fall on the side of if we are, it's not been done by an architect. Uh, <laughs> the risk that the edifice falls down is uh, it gets blown down with a stiff wind is high. Um, Donors, as, as I'm sure many people on this call know, have a great need for shiny new things. And, and so donors can be in conflict with themselves. They can be sitting in established partnerships, uh, putting for, really pushing for certain activities um, uh, and uh, holding, uh, holding up the partnership with, conditions of you must do this new thing to satisfy our political masters. And at the same time, they are creating new things to satisfy their political masters. Uh, so for me, I think it's important to highlight the donor's role in there. And I do find them using your analytical framework. I find them to be among the weaker links. Thanks. Augustina, how about uh, you've got your hand up? How about your thoughts? Yes, uh, thanks, Andre, and uh, hello, everybody. So I can share uh, my thoughts about the health uh, landscape. Um, I work with the GFF, and when the GFF um, uh, when the GFF was established, it was already a very busy landscape. So. Um, um, and the bank and a couple of other uh, donors and institutions had uh, the the idea and the concept for the GFF, but uh, in order to uh, to uh, to go ahead with that partnership, there was a, a, a extensive uh, period, uh, not e extensive in period of time, but in in depth of consultations with absolutely. Um, uh, everybody, every participant in the landscape to, to make sure that the interests are aligned, that um, there are no overlaps, that this a new partnership can survive into this busy landscape. And um, another thought that came to me while uh, I was listening at the end of your presentation, Andrea, I'm sorry that I uh, connected late. Um, another thought that came to me is that um, obviously it is an environment that is not regulated by anybody, the relationship between the partnerships. So it is within, it is a responsibility of every partnership to, uh, to maintain such relationships with the other partnerships. And I think uh, although it may create a lot of uh, 
effort and uh, uh, it might be quite stressful and challenging to work in uh, such an unregulated environment. On the other side, it's an opportunity because um, by having this unregulated uh, area of relationships, um, uh, you can be, uh, you know, creative, opportunistic, you can uh, continue refining your, your vision, your relationships and how you, you work with others. Um, yeah, so these are my two inputs to that conversation. Yeah, thank you, Agustina, because really you live the health dynamic every day. And as you say, the origins were really deliberate and carefully thought through. But a lot has also happened since the GFF was established. So the, the space is certainly continuing to evolve. And it's not clear to me that there's enough architecture to really think it all through. I hope that this new initiative that's you know circulating that that is you know there's a lot of political pressure to put something in place from what I can tell um, that it is also taking a similarly deliberative approach with with uh, looking at the GFF and others. I do think Nicola to pick up on your point about the donors um, I, I donors really have um, are a significant part of determining whether things are consolidating and aligning or whether they're diffusing. And I think we're seeing a certain amount of diffusion here. It's not new, but of course, over time, it becomes more and more um, filled with different initiatives and activities. But Stephen, reflecting on what you were saying, I think we can also see an evolving donor space where it's not just individual donors diffusing their own efforts but the donor space itself is becoming more and more diffuse. And we're adding not just sort of marginal players, we're adding really significant players with a huge amount of heft. But I think this is also a place where we get to step back. And I think the World Bank has a you know, really consequential role here in how it's going to align itself with these other partnerships because there is a very big distinction between private foundations in many different ways, but they are corporate entities within national frameworks, you know, speaking structurally, speaking in terms of the legal entity. And by and large, they do not have international shareholders, uh, certainly not sovereign shareholders, the way the multilaterals and international organizations do. And they do not have privileges and immunities, which is this rarity that, you know, it's, I don't know how, whether it's even possible to get that today again, but it's a, a vestige of the Bretton Woods era. And so any international organization or multilateral that has privileges and immunities, I think, has a special obligation to the international community to engage in activities that are really appropriate and leverage that that uh, you know, extraordinary status in the international global community now. So part of it is comparative advantages, looking at who the players are and really recognizing that the World Bank, for example, you know, to, to pick up your comment, Stephen, has this very, very significant comparative advantage and has also, as an existing entity, let's go back to our definition of international partnership programs, is extremely robust and established and has all these webs of connections within it and into the international community to really be able to leverage that you know, extraordinarily privileged position that it and many of the UN organizations and other MDBs and inter -org international organizations with history have. So a little bit of my spiel there, but yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, you're on mute right now. There we go. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I always think about is reputational risk whenever I'm involved in any of these situations. And um, I always raise it. What's our reputational risk for getting involved or not getting involved? Uh, the other is we do have a partnership group within the bank 
that um, has been um, less than satisfying to work with, but probably has a greater role than it may think. The other is donors. Donors, at, that we, we think about donors as really official donors. It, that, that it, it's a default, oh, it's a government donor, donors, but it's not. It's, you said, we now have a larger universe of non-sovereign donors. A uh, question I was gonna ask is, do we have any of our sovereign donors who actually think about partnerships the way we've been talking about them? I, I, I have kind of run up against what I call the tyranny of the desk officer. And within any aid, agent, aid agency, with our major donors, government donors, you will have different points of view, as Nicholas said, on exactly what quote unquote, the relationship should be between that donor and the bank. And you can get two or three different points of view, depending on who's the desk office you're dealing with, that has a budget to spend on a particular area. And that doesn't necessarily translate into consistent governance of the donor's money. So I'm kind of curious whether from the, if, are there any donors that you know that actually do this right, that have a uniform look at core and part, you know, what, how they are approaching um, their various partnerships uh, with uh, the bank and the multilateral institutions in the UN. Um, <clears throat> and the other, of course, is we're all taking the, your, the, the amounts of money, private money that are now available in foundations uh, are is astronomical. And, uh, and if we really carved at these foundations, they're probably registered in Delaware. <laughs> and, you know, they're 501c3s in Delaware and, and they look um, highly, how can I put it? Um, um, what's the word? Vanity type. Um, foundations that are really run by one or two people or one person, and it's their money. Uh, and and the newer the newer money is not nearly as as well heal as well managed as say the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. You know, people who've been doing this for a hundred years have a have a, I think a pretty good idea of what their partner Ford, Rockefeller. Um, you know, they have some at least have a track record and they understand partnerships. Um, I'm not sure about for I'm Rockefeller and Ra Shah, that's different. We may, they, they've moved on to kind of a different focus, but certainly Ford and some of the others uh, may have a better um, uh, template. Uh, but I'm always curious about what governments do it right, if any. Yeah, so um, I saw Diana had her hand up, but let me just say very quickly, I think as we've been saying, it often very much depends on personality. So it's really hard to generalize about the donor as the sovereign specifically. It depends on the culture of the ministry. It depends a little bit on the politics of the moment. Um, I think that some donors and some topics have presented more collaborative instincts than others, you know, so we'll see it happen and then a new fifth will emerge because the pressure is on to collaborate. But then, you know, we see that over the life of the fifth, maybe it becomes less important. So these uh, international platforms are really donors expressing the power of the purse in a very collaborative way, but not necessarily in a sustained way always. Um, ironically, I'm working, I'm supporting a client right now, which is a sovereign, it's a government, it's a donor, and they're looking at their donor position in potential partnership, also in some respect existing partnerships. And they are pushing for more partnership and more collaboration and more core and more definition of the common terms and more alignment. And they are finding that their supporting entities, their counterparts in this, are less on that page. And we've also seen that, you know, I've, I, I wouldn't want to point fingers too much, but we've seen that with the World Bank specifically, where the effort to have inclusive governing bodies to be more collaborative, to be more horizontal, 
unless, you know, vertical, it's not just about implementation and results. It's also about global coordination and alignment within and without where the World Bank has been a very challenging supporting entity because the instinct there is more towards that vertical, you know, driving towards bank operations and downstream into the countries as opposed to horizontal. So it's not insignificant when I pointed just now to this new fund of funds in the health space that's being considered that my understanding is that the World Bank is at least one of the candidates for providing the trustee and secretariat support through a fifth, through a financial intermediary fund, one of these international platforms. And that's after having heard for at least a couple of years that the bank was no longer interested in setting up new fifths. Now, that's not official, but it's, you know, never say never. So this uh, collaborative instinct will will appear. And when we're talking about pandemic preparedness and we need a fund of funds to look at where the gaps are and to really do these international collaborations, it's not surprising that the effort is gravitating towards a supporting entity that has a lot of that history and the capacity to do that as opposed to say private foundations. But the, the convergence through the supporting entity is driven by the donors ultimately. So here we have a case where there's a very collaborative instinct again. Um, and obviously has to be thought through in terms of the overall international aid architecture. Diana, your hand's been up, so let me stop and turn to you. Yeah, I was just going to um, echo what you were just saying. My, my point was that it always often depends on um, the political situation at the time. And, and when, when there are political changes, the donor priorities change. And we've seen that several times. Um, I specifically, I had a commitment, a verbal commitment from Canada for a lot of, a lot of money for um, EITI and EGPS. And all of a sudden, you know, there was, they announced an election and there was a moratorium on any and agreements at all being signed. So, um, and that went into effect until after the election. And, and so this is, that's just a, a real life example of how, you know, the, the politics can, can change the landscape. And the, um, and also you also have a lot of turnover in the, in the ministries. Um, and you may have really good collaboration with one contact and then, that person leaves and the next one um, may turn out to be okay, but it takes a while to get them up to speed on, on the program. And, and, and so I think that, um, I think the banks, um, the banks trust funds are kind of a reflection of the, the shifting priorities of donors, you know, the plethora of trust funds. And I think that, you know, with the umbrellas, they're trying to sort of consolidate that and, and maybe not be so much at the, at you know, being beholden to the whims of the donors and the political changes that take place um, to, to keep some more continuity, but um, there's always there's always going to be shifts. Um, and so hopefully that that um, more structured um, you know, and donors will come and go um, from those those umbrellas. Um, but that's but that will reflect their priorities at the time. And that should be a little bit more stable, at least. So, all right. For those of you who are left, shall we continue for a bit longer, Jane? Yes, please uh, give us your thoughts. Okay. Hi, hi. This was really good, Andrea, as always, and everyone made such really great interventions. And I, I really, I mean, it's just incredible how much things change and how much they stay the same. So, I mean, just that diagram of the health aid architecture reminded me of two things that I learned in the last couple of years. One is a couple of years ago, the bank and the global fund signed a co-financing framework agreement, which like, I mean, that to me was like a when hell freezes over type of thing. When the global fund started, I mean, they wanted specifically not to have a World Bank type approach to any of their projects. But I think 
there's been so much emphasis on health systems development and you know both and then the, the the second thing i heard recently is that gavi was looking for someone to help them um find better ways to work with the world bank <laughs> you know just like you know somebody who kind of knew the inside and it wasn't me but but somebody who could like press on contacts how can we work better with the, with the world bank and you know i mean so and just the fact that you know I, it seems like the bank you know well the establishment of the gff and it's nice to see augustina again somebody very solid working on that you know it's just it's the, the old problem in my view is that development is hard it's hard to spend money well and it's hard to account for it in terms of not only the sheer accounting what did you spend this money on but achieving results and there are not that many agents on the ground who can do that and the bank has one approach to it i'm not saying the bank is the only game in town there but it's just that it's expensive and difficult and it's you know what you say andrea about the core and um you know the bank is definitely guilty of being too vertically focused on well what are we going to do at country level and you know neglecting maybe some of the big international more horizontal parts of these partnerships but the bank has been one reliable one reliable out outsourcing opportunity for donors to do that, you know, try to spend the money well, try to coordinate with others, you know, try to, in terms of at least with the other sources of funds that the bank is, is involved with, and then trying to, and then being able to report back, or at least trying to report back and having, having one theory for that. I'm not saying the bank's paradigm is the only one, but especially what I've seen working on FCV the last couple of years is that the bank now is also using the UN more, you know, it start, I think this started pretty much with Yemen about six, eight years ago with, you know, taking the Ida money and putting it through humanitarian channels. And, um, you know, I'm, I'll be anxious to see, I heard that there's a financing package for Ukraine being developed through Ida and other sources. And I'll be interested to see if Ida, I mean, I don't think the bank can implement that on the ground. So will it again be this new HDP nexus, the humanitarian development peace nexus, you know, through which more and more um, funds are being put through the old humanitarian partner channels. So anyway, I just wanted to say thanks. It's so great to see everybody and, um, you know, keep, keep it going. <laughs> Yeah, Jane, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, yes, you're right. So much changes, so much stays the same. You and I had, have had a history of working on thinking about the bank as a good partner. You know, what does it mean to be a good partner and how can the bank be a good partner? So the first element there is, of course, that the bank is a partner, right? So we're not some outsourced delivery function. We're not just a service contractor. We step into these roles as a partner. And what we're doing there is we're sharing the same objectives, the same goal. It's within our mandate. So it's much more significant than just being hired you know, by a private foundation to do something. And that may be the first lesson that these private foundations need to understand, that we are coming at it with our whole institution as a partner. But I do think that over the years, the bank has had a lot of opportunity to develop its partnering skills and to be try to be a good partner. And I think that in the GFF context, the bank has really been an exemplary partner. Um, and Augustina and Valentina could speak to that more. I think in FCV, the bank has made huge efforts to be a good partner within the international community. Essentially, as you say, the H... DP Nexus, a partner of the UN, a partner of humanitarian efforts, and thinking about that linkage between humanitarian development and also peace. So there's certainly room for improvement, but I would suggest that the ability of the bank to partner effectively and be a good partner, and essentially with its comparative advantage, be a good supporting entity, has been validated enough that other partners keep coming back to us and that that will continue and that the bank will continue to have this extremely important role if it's open to it, if it's willing to embrace it in these crisis environments, in the global public goods environment, you know, and that other players may come and go, but I would love to see 
the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, others, the UN agencies continue to be able to bring their special characteristics to bear within this um, international community. Uh, and I think that they will continue to be the robust established existing entity that I try to lift out in this definition of international partnership programs, which is to say it is an amazing modality out there to lean on these existing established entities and to find the right balance to make it work. But it's that new partnership around that existing established basis that is so powerful. Nicola. I really, yes, I really want to underscore the importance of Jane's point. Jane, thank you for raising that, the humanitarian and development, that linkage. And the importance is such that thinking back 15 years or so ago, the conversation was, well, these are just two completely separate budgets. And so when we're thinking about donor internal coherence, there was very little of it because they weren't talking amongst themselves. This was really valid, for instance, for Sierra Leone, because we were, uh, we were on the path of, of humanitarian to development, but they were such, such different conversations. So the fact that the bank is open in ways that it hasn't been before. Um, I can still remember very clearly a manager of mine sharply um, yet, oh, I don't even want to characterize it, but saying, yes, well, you know, the bank is a UN specialized agency, but kind of, you know, but we don't really own it. Um, we, we distinguish ourselves from, from the UN. And to the extent that that seems to be shifting, I'm no longer at the bank, so I don't know. I, I do remember in the last few years seeing how some, including some at rather high levels, tried very hard to get that rapprochement and it wasn't necessarily met with anything. It wasn't, it wasn't met with enthusiasm, let me put it that way. But we, <laughs> Jane, I see, I see you laughing. You can probably imagine some of the conversations just trying to get some of the management to respond to requests from the bank's New York office, not from the UN, but the bank's New York office to just say, how does, for instance, the, bank, the banks or our partnerships work respond to the SDGs? That was a hard thing. Anyway, just Jane, really important point. Thank you for making it. Sounds like we're making progress. Any other thoughts? Um, Valentina. Yeah, just to say thank you very much for this session. As usually, very informative and interesting. And uh, you have added new visuals, which are very relevant. I like the net, which can speak volumes and the small spider within the big net. That's very interesting. And the basket of fruits. Yeah, that's uh, congrats. You always entertain with your session. Um, I wanted to ask you also following on Augustina's question, can you share anything you know about this upcoming fifth with us? Anything you know? So I know very little. I'm supposed to find out a bit more. Um, I'm having a conversation with a prospective client <laughs> on this. So I also want to be a bit careful because I don't know to what extent these things are confidential, although it wasn't really said that way. But I, the way it was characterized to me, I think I can say this. First of all, it was described as a potential fifth which I think is very significant because I know, for example, the GFF was looking down that road and there's been a lot of dissuasion and discontent with that space. Although my position has always been that if you build your fifth, your international platform properly, it can be an amazing space. Um, but obviously there's some things you need to take into consideration as you build it and as you, as you maintain it. Um, it is meant to be, I think, almost like a superstructure. So you have all these existing cornucopia <laughs> uh, fruits happening already, 
but this is meant to be an integrative platform which involves all the existing players. And that's one of the questions is what would the governance of this look like? Involves them as downstream fiduciaries to a large part, at least where appropriate, but enables the international community to look at the entire global environment and think about are we doing everything we need to do to be prepared for the next pandemic? So preparedness and prevention. And where are the gaps? And honestly, it reminds me quite a lot of the GFF. And I haven't had enough conversations with this person to really think about whether it's that applicable. But I, I did mention you as, a, as a, a, a place that's worth looking. Um, in particular, because you are essentially creating that collaborative infrastructure through the investment cases and through your country collaborations. So you, you kind of pile on these collaborative efforts within your space. So my sense is this, this fund of funds is supposed to first take that collaborative uh, position and then do the assessments collaboratively and evaluations that are necessary. And then a portion, just like you do in your investment cases, a portion who is doing what part of it. So in an ideal world, instead of putting that cornucopia, putting that new fund down at the bottom, maybe it is that integrative fund, which is what I was talking about. Maybe it is a structural approach to actually creating an aid architecture that's functional. You know, it might not even need to be a strong implementing vehicle. It could be a strong coordination vehicle. At least that's how I would see it. But, you know, just as a case study, it is really interesting to think about can, you know, how would we take the health environment right now with all its different fruits in the basket and create more of a structure? And do you need another layer of structure to do that? Or can you work with what you have? So oh, I, I said much more than might be specific to this case because I know so little, but you know, even just thinking about it as a model. And Jane, when you wanted to say something. Just as an outsider to all the thinking about this, I think I even did hear about this years ago, but um, I would think that the number one thing they want is top-notch analytics so that like you can compare some of the apples and oranges across all the different funds and good luck getting any information out of PEPFAR because you know, years and years ago when I worked on that global country linkage study, we looked a lot at how the different health funds were coming together at the country level. And there was an absolutely terrific study done at that time by ODI, was it Mitch something? Anyway, um, and that was the most helpful. It just showed, for example, that health aid spending had gone up from like a dollar a person, which is what we always used to hear in a lot of African countries that the amount of money spent on health was so low. It was like, it had gone up in certain countries to like, you know, from a, like $3 a head to like $25 a head. And a lot of it was earmarked for then HIV AIDS or, you know, other things. So, I mean, just this kind of analytics I think is really, really powerful. And if, if you could have um, something, uh, an entity that did that across all the health aid architecture, to really speak to where are the gaps, which countries are getting a lot of money, but it may be heavily earmarked, which countries are able to spend for health systems, which was always the orphaned issue. And, you know, there's been so much work done, but, you know, across all the, the programs that you, that you had on your chart, on your graphic, I mean, I, I couldn't even know how to start comparing them. They all work so differently. And, you know, this issue of, earmarked versus unearmarked funds turned out to be one of the big salient issues that came out of the work that we did, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah, and I'm sure it's still very, very important now, but uh, it's also a really Im interesting point you make. I, I may be misinterpreting this, but I think if you look more closely at the emergence of the humanitarian development nexus in the FCV space, that a lot of the energy there has really been on the same kind of data collection and analytics, that that has been a very important starting point is to first convene around 
the data and the analytics and the assessment. And so um, a lot of FCV's energy over the last years as they were developing this paradigm was to think about the resilient and risk assessments, or maybe it's the other way around, risk and resilience assessments, the RRAs, to really operationalize those as a tool to collaborate and coordinate within that humanitarian development space. So using, again, the, the World Bank's comparative advantage, but linking it with the humanitarian efforts. And in the FCV space, it starts with that common narrative, that common understanding of the analytics, the assessment, which then opens up to who's doing what and how are we going to do it either side by side or collaboratively or hierarchically or whatever the mechanism ends up being. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on this. I posed the question in the chat a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, however, behind it, there's a rather serious uh, concern. And, and of course, I don't know anything about this particular uh, initiative, this potential fund of funds. But something. Nicola, to just let me just say for the recording what your question is. Oh, the question. Oh, I didn't realize it wouldn't. Uh, um, uh, keep the chat. The question is, uh, is whether it's going to be more of a smoothie or a fruit salad? Because uh, arguably one, one might want to keep the individuality of all of those funds, the, uh, the, the special added value that each of them brings, or some might want to mold everything into one, uh, one, um, one very integrated, you were using the word integrated. So does it look more like a smoothie? Is it everything ground into one and you can't tell the difference between them? Or will there be enough, uh, enough flexibility to allow for each existing partnership, fund, entity, et cetera, to be able to add its own value? That was my question. And of course, the answer will always be that it's in the balance, that there's room for both. And if you think about, for example, the Paris Declaration, the ACRA Agenda for Action, there were some commitments, quote unquote, commitments made in terms of harmonizing efforts. So you might not have to amalgamate, amalgamate the structures completely, but at least create some more harmonization that makes it easier for the downstream countries and other recipients to operate within this very <laughs> diffuse environment, um, you know, hydra-headed environment. But um, I think we will always want to think modular in terms of modular approaches, the same way we do partnership components within, you know, secretariat, trustee, governing body, trust fund, all those pieces have their specific place and their comparative advantage, we can translate that to the international community, keep the modularity, but think about how that all fits together structurally, even as we're harmonizing and integrating some of our approaches. Anyhow, we're a good bit over the hour and I suppose it, was, it was good and, <laughs> and I, um, for everybody else on here, Andrea, Andrea did not, pay me to tee up her answer there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I feel teed up at every, every juncture here and appreciate all of the inputs. Um, but I think we will continue again next month. And uh, as we get all these inspiring conversations, I'm thinking about what would the series three look like and you know, be able to continue. So uh, it's really wonderful that you're participating in this community of practice here and that we can also make it available to others in the international community. So I'll send you all out into spring. Have a wonderful day and we'll convene again next month. Thank, Thank you so everybody. much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot. It was really good. Bye-bye. Yep.